As we talk about those big drops for some of these names that you have long tracked, in some cases now down 70, 80 percent this year, what goes through your mind? Uh, we keep our um, perspective in the long term. Uh, you either believe that this decade is going to be one of technological innovation or you don't. Uh, you either believe that um, AI, the cost of AI training falling in half every nine months is going to yield massive productivity advances in it, or you don't. And uh, it's clear that right now the market is not pricing assets based on their fundamentals. Uh, asset prices are being uh, whipped around by asset flows between between uh, asset classes by allocators. And so from our perspective, uh, you're getting amazing sale prices in innovation assets. And um, we believe that everybody needs to have a meaningful exposure to innovation in their portfolio, that um, many investors who um, have Benchmark exposures to uh, traditional indices have unintentional innovation shorts. Where if this really is, uh, if if kind of being able to get uh, a cancer diagnosis from a blood vial is a meaningful advance and going to drive uh, you know billions of dollars in revenue, then assets will appreciate on the back end of that, and that will put um, some traditional service providers at risk. If EV autonomous trucks are going to be cost competitive with freight rail over the course of this business cycle, then those traditional rail lines are actually going to be materially less valuable than you currently think they're going to be. And so that position in your core index exposure is going to be put into stress. And so you better own the innovation opportunity that's on the back end of that in the event that these technology promises come to fruition. Brett, it all makes sense to invest in innovation early on, but to make that a real possibility, it kind of seems like you have to have these cash cushions. It's the very cash cushions that perhaps drove a lot of these big tech gains in the last two years. But if you look at some of these companies, even the EV spaces, biotech, for example, they don't have the cash cushions to make that a reality. How do you square that with this inflationary environment where perhaps cash is king? Well, I don't think that's true uniformly across the technology space. If you look at, for instance, Zoom, it's massively cash flow positive. And, and I think that in, in some ways, investors either want the companies to generate cash and then they punish them on kind of the cash flow generation that they're yielding, or they say, oh, oh, these companies need cash in their pocket. In the biotech space, certainly in the therapeutics um, business, those are businesses where you are spending R&D to generate pipelines that will ultimately yield potential cures to uh, rare diseases. And so um, those companies are frequently partnering with larger companies to um, to bring cash onto their books and, and upfront some of the potential revenue recognition that would come from those pipeline assets. Uh, and, uh, you know, over the last three years, we've seen amazing progression in demonstration of capabilities in the likes of gene editing. Um, so I think that the, um, at this moment in the marketplace, yes, I think that um, traders are going out there and looking at the cash burn of, of every position in the market and saying, uh, we're going to try to aggressively target and short those companies that are going to have to raise at any time over the next year. Uh, and that provides an opportunity for investors with a long-term point of view to actually capture meaningful uh, ownership positions in these companies that are likely to yield uh, meaningful meaningful cash flow generation events in the medium term. Uh, so as an innovation manager that's taking, uh, um, you know, doing fundamental work on the cash flow generative capabilities of the assets in these companies, this is a great opportunity. Uh, and that's what we're focused on. And Brett, just to, to try to put your comments in context with this violent selling that we have seen in the broader market every day, people are trying to figure out, have we possibly reached a bottom from all this selling pressure for the broader market? There is this strong narrative out there that there could be more challenging times ahead for technology. You alluded to those who might be betting against this sector right now. How do you approach that? I mean, you're long term in thinking. You made that very clear. Are you prepared to accept more pain for this sector in the short term? Listen, our clients hire us to, to provide a concentrated exposure to disruptive innovation that we believe will recognize into um, 
massive value appreciation over the medium term. And that's exactly what we seek to provide to them. You know, and we communicate to clients that that's what we're going to do. The worst thing we could do for our clients would be to suddenly change our spots and say, oh, we're, we're worried about, um, you know, the, the marginal inflation numbers. And so we're going to um, kind of back off on our aggressive investments in technologies that are going to change the world. Uh, we think that clients um, of our strategies um, size their positions in a responsible way relative to the rest of their portfolios so that they can take advantage of these kinds of downdrafts that are not being driven by fundamentals and buy into and at least um, keep a, a relatively um, stable um, percent exposure to our types of strategies or even double down. Uh, and that's what you've seen. You've seen client inflows into our strategies because people understand that the medium term um, re recognition of what's going on in technology is going to res result in um, market business value creation. This is not a, um, this is potentially a once in a generation business cycle for technology. And I think people understand that they need to have. A, a meaningful technology exposure to take advantage of. Brett, let's talk about some of the individual holdings within the ARK Innovation Fund. I want to talk about Tesla and GM in particular. Tesla, for a long time now, has been one of the major holdings. But in the last quarter, it looks like uh, the fund sold about $13 million of the stock and recently bought GM shares. I have to ask about Tesla's role in the EV universe. Do you think it's losing market share to some of these newer names? And to what extent? Oh, Tesla is incredibly well positioned. It remains the number one exposure in our flagship strategy as well as in other strategies. Um, the, um, and we think that the opportunity for um, robo taxis, for autonomous electric vehicles that will transport you from place to place at less than the cash cost of operating your car, so not even taking into account the fact that you're, you're saving the time and energy of being an amateur driver on the road, is a uh, um, 20 or $30 trillion business value creation event. We think over the course of the decade, this is going to be, you know, uh, at uh, multiples of the value attributed to the global oil sector today, the business platforms that occupy um, this robo-taxi um, opportunity. And so there is room for both multiple winners and for an assessment that we can't be sure who exactly is going to operate in that spot. Cruise automation inside of GM is demonstrably ahead of the field in terms of capability. They have a commercial service operating in San Francisco today. They've expanded to most of San Francisco. And uh, if they're able to use that position to kind of secure a footprint and select cities in the US, that would be incredibly valuable to that company. And we think Tesla's largest deployed fleet of robots in the world, which is what their cars are, gives them a tremendous data advantage to scalably solve that problem. So you can believe in, in both companies and the, and the strategies that the companies have. Uh, and so that's, it's, it's not a you know, Tesla or GM, it's within our automation and robotics portfolio. Um, GM is an interesting exposure to the robo taxi opportunity that we think is is massively undervalued by the marketplace today Brett, and Brett, we're almost out of time, but you did. Oh, sorry, Critty. I was just going to no, say that you it. have obviously this uh, exposure to Coinbase as well. What was your reaction to the quarterly results there? I mean, I think that the 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 quarterly results were largely as we expected. We knew that trading volumes were down. Um, I think that the, the fact is this is a, a company with the enterprise value of, a, of below $10 billion now, and um, they're likely to be one of the leading companies in providing the full vertically integrated suite of financial um, services that, that will transmit through the, the crypto asset market. Uh, and uh, I, I think people will look back on this five years from now and be like, I cannot believe that that company was available at these prices um, because the, the entire financial services sector is going to have to transition to incorporate the capabilities that, that um, public blockchains provide to end customers, to um, 
own and transfer digital assets around the world. And Coinbase is in the, the, the capbird seat in terms of providing those services. And so um, we think it's an incredible value and, and that it's a management team that knows how to invest into the opportunities that lie in front of it in an intelligent and aggressive way.